Okay, up next we have our final panel, if other panelists can turn their cameras on, and um, it is chaired by Brooks. Please go ahead, thanks. Hi everybody, uh, welcome to this panel, panel discussion, which will be on the social benefits of AI. Uh, so my name is Brooks. I'm an associate professor at the AI Center. I'll be chairing the session. So I'd like to start by introducing the everybody here. Um, so John Shaw Taylor is a professor in the CS department at UCL. Here is the UNESCO chair of AI and director of IRCAI. I don't know if you pronounce the acronym or say the letters, but the International Research Center on AI under the auspices of UNESCO in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, Maria Perez-Ortiz is a senior research fellow at the Department of CS. Uh, Julien Coinabis is an honorary associate professor at CS, and he's formerly an early researcher at DeepMind and also formerly head of Element AI's uh, former London office and its former AI for Good team, uh, and still works with several other uh, social actors. Um, Kathy Holloway is a professor of interaction design and innovation at UCL's Interaction Center and is the acad academic director and co-founder of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. Um, and finally, Delmiro Fernandez Reyes is a professor of biomedical computing here also at CS at UCL. Um, so we'll be talking about the potential of AI for social good and generally I think the opportunities of social benefits for AI. And I think we're all interested in understanding this better. I think um, we're all, you know, I, th I think it's important to take a potentially critical view. So it's, it's, it's important that we as an AI center where a lot of us are focused on developing these sorts of technologies, you know, we don't purely take on a role as cheerleaders for deployment and proliferation of AI without carefully considering the impact such systems will have as they hit the real world. Um, at the same time, I think there's also, um, we all believe that there's a lot of potential for AI to really help people in, in meaningful ways, including making uh, significant contributions to at least some of, uh, say, the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals set forth by the UN. Um, so to kick this off, I'm going to hand over to each of the panelists to spend a few minutes um, sharing their viewpoints on social benefits of AI and AI for good, which should provide a starting point for the discussion. Um, and uh, after that, we'll take questions from the audience in the Zoom Q&A section. So please do enter questions there that we would, you'd like us to discuss. Um, and I guess, uh, I don't know, uh, John, would you like to start? Sure, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Brooks. Thanks for the introduction and uh, uh, welcome to everyone. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, we actually had a little bit of a email discussion amongst the panel beforehand. And I think we were all little perhaps surprised at how many of us were raising questions about, which is exactly what Brooks has highlighted. But let me just first start by saying something positive. You know, I think that the, you know, AI is an incredibly uh, powerful tool uh, and is, you know, growing in its range of applications as we've seen in some of the presentations today. Um, so, in that sense, we have at our disposal, you know, a step up in technology potentially that is showing greater flexibility and greater reach and greater ability to engage with uh, you know, noisy signals and difficult uh, environments um, that is at our disposal. And at the same time, I think we all agree that the world is facing you know, an unprecedented set of crises um, brought on by uh, humanity's behavior and actions from climate change uh, and the corresponding results of that through pollution to, uh, let's say, social issues. So, you know, it seems a no-brainer that we bring to bear this new tool uh, in order to address those issues. And I believe, you know, it is going to be a key component in addressing many of those issues. And, I, you know, I'm not going to enumerate ideas now, but um, perhaps, uh, you know, they will come out in the panel discussion. But certainly those, you know, we should not forget that this is a technology. Now, I think where the panel sort of also slightly uh, took breath was in understanding the level of worry we have about the negative potential social implications. And I think, you know, perhaps the, the obvious ones that spring out are, you know, controlling citizens, uh, manipulating people, 
and uh, you know, the, the use of AI in terms of creating as a byproduct uh, these social bubbles that we have seen and their influence or in destabilizing our system of um, running our society. So I think these are you know, genuine issues that we would, I think it would have been very hard to predict. I mean, I certainly do not predict. Um, but that we need to address and take seriously as Brooke said, I think you know, it's absolutely right that we should be, as potentially developers of these technologies or involved in the development of them, we should be thinking about their negative impacts and trying to imagine how we might offset them. And indeed, I think you know, AI researchers are responding. The work that has been uh, coming out of the revealed, let's say, bias and data, unfairness, uh, with, you know, for example, the recruitment policies that are biased against uh, women in favor of men uh, that were revealed essentially by an AI system attempting to mimic human behavior. And, you know, I think it would be wrong to criticize the AI system. The AI system was just doing what it was told, but it did actually uncover huge uh, you know, in, inadequacies in the, in the process of recruitment in that particular organization. So I think those are, you know, if you like, potentially positive benefits that we're seeing coming out of, but it only comes out if we take the social implications very seriously and address them in you know, novel and uh, you know, important ways. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I just want to emphasize that uh, we, we need to keep a balanced view and not forget positives, but, but also not forget the negatives. Right. No, I, I didn't mean to sound too negative in my portrayal of this by any means. I think uh, I think there's actually a, a lot of ways in which we can help. Um, I, I guess uh, going kind of in the order that you all appear on my Zoom screen, which I acknowledge might not be everybody's. Uh, Maria, would you like to, to go next? <laughs> or Domiro, you're unmuted. So, or... I know, I unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me go then. Maria, do you want me to go or you go? No, I can go. I can go. Go, go, go then. I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you, Brooks. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I will start similarly to John addressing one big benefit that I see of, of AI and specifically in environmental AI systems, which is a topic that I've worked on before. And I think of course, environment and society are deeply interlinked. And for me, at least both of them intersect at the big timely challenge that we are currently facing, which is ensuring ecological survival. Um, but specifically, I want to talk about the new agri-tech revolution, which has been named recently Agriculture 5.0, and which uses AI to monitor crops and automate um, agricultural practices. So I think for me, this, uh, this is a very good display of an application in which AI can have a positive side. And this is specifically because modern agriculture will face two very big challenges in the next decade, which are you know, like a, um, a need for uh, ensuring food production for a very growing um, human population. And the second one is to tackle the impact of climate change, which is already creating lots of problems, irregular crop seasons, new invasive pests and so on. So a, this is one of, the, one of the fields in which I think AI can have a very big impact, uh, a positive one in terms of crop protection, managing pests and ensuring food security. But uh, on, the, on, on a similar note to what we've been discussing, I think it's very important to look at the two sides of the coin with regards to the benefits of AI. And I think it's, it's important that we become used to analyzing both sides. So for example, in this case, if we think of this specific application, the other side would be that, you know, this type of technologies uh, will increase inequality because uh, small producers are not going to have access to such, te such technologies. And of course there is as well, the planetary cost of AI, carbon footprint of AI, which might be aggravating in the first place, the problem that we are trying to solve, which is the, the, the effects of climate change, right? Um, so in terms of negative sides, I'm sure most of us have heard many of these, but I just wanted to address um, what are the questions that maybe we need to tackle in order to think of these positive negative sides and ensure a positive impact of AI. And, and for me, the, the questions that we need to address are AI by whom, AI for whom, AI with whose interests in mind, 
and also what kind of politics are embedded in these AI systems. And for me, this, this relates to two big problems, these four questions, which is that AI centralizes power and we need to examine power in these algorithms and challenge and redistribute that power. Um, and the second one is related to AI by whom? The idea that you know, AI is actually not artificial, it's embodied, it's made of human labor. And it's specifically, it's created by a very small and incredibly homogeneous group of people. And the industry needs to embrace uh, pluralism and intersectionality. Um, so I don't like to take a negative stand without um, having a few actionable notes, which is what I'm going to do next, because I think that's what we should focus on uh, in order to ensure a positive impact of AI. So from my point of view, there are three actions that we as AI researchers can take. Uh, the first one is due to, to the power that these algorithms hold. As John said, we have to take an individual responsibility to become literate in these questions, and we need to educate the next generation on these questions. And obviously, we need to stop feeding this techno-heroic narrative that is that we have in the field. Um, the second thing that I think uh, we should do is to, to end this dichotomy between theory and practice, and we need to work very closely with other research areas. And I, I was told once something that stay with me, which is, do computer scientists know how to answer questions with data and algorithms very well, but you just don't know what questions need answering. And I think this is up to some extent very true. So I think for me, we need to urgently engage with the rest of the world to know what questions need answering. And lastly, finally, I think that the last uh, actionable item that I can think of is that we need to collaborate in order to build some kind of integrative framework that can help us evaluate algorithms in terms of whether they can help us create more just, more fair, or more livable future. And this obviously is not going to take the form of a simplistic evaluation metric that we can use as a loss function to, to optimize our algorithm. Uh, but I think it's it's uh, such a framework uh, is very much needed in order to um, create true and lasting positive social impact of AI. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I, I appreciate the action items a lot, actually. I think that's... Um, Delmiro, I guess. Is okay, that... yeah, I got sure. I... Uh, thank you, thank you, John and, and, and Maria, for this such a very interesting topic. So, I'm gonna I actually recap, recapitulate a bit from what John said. It's actually certainly a very powerful tool for some of the reasons that Maria commented. And, and that, any, as any powerful tool we create as a sapiens species, is uh, how its uses and misuses. Okay, so as we know. There's the ethics and etc. The point I want to kind of concentrate before we go before I go to the possible beneficial and perhaps social impact is, is to remember what was if if one let's say side effect of uh, side effect of AI and Maria was alluding to it uh, is automation. Okay. If we go to automation and we kind of go back what happened in the first industrial revolution and you go back to the Dickensian, the uh, London and all that, we need to see what it might well happen, okay? So we might take a lot of well-needed jobs out of the question immediately, etc. So that, that is something, no, no small fit. Paradoxically, if you've been working in, in places like in, in low middle income countries, so let's say Nigeria, the paradox is that the AI and all the, the, the computational sciences and related fields and new technologies actually are generating a, 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 a plethora of entrepreneurship and employment to, 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 to a so sector of the, of the community. So, so it's a paradox, you know. I can see more important in these places when there is deficiency of many, let's say, infrastructure, etc. It generates an economy around that, which is a very strong positive effect. So basically, while perhaps in London, the autonomous car will leave, let's say, 100,000 drivers from Uber without a job, 
actually dying gonna be the case in a year because the first if there is not those cars, it might be that actually you become you create industries like providing services, which might be more effective, but they still need humans as as um, as Maria was pointing out, you know, AI is not owned by a spontaneous generation. There is some humans behind, and, 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 and it is true and that. So if, you, if I go to the kind of um, um, the way I see it in what I do daily, the reason of the AI and myself in a way, is that in certain areas of work, on certain niches of applications, on certain areas, you are mostly dealing with human error. Human error uh, is not because we are not very good machines, we are excellent machines, but, but we are actually not very reliable and constant in many ways, behavioral, uh, cognitive bias, and tiredness, okay? So in, the, in that case, I bring it to my area of work, which is in, in the biomedical and healthcare sector, in which I will, and they, you know, a lot of people are talking about these replacements for the, 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 the human expert for this, I say, no, that is a completely crazy stuff. The society really doesn't need that. Uh, but you need this augmentate, augmentation and, and in a way to aid cognitive, cognitive uh, load and actually cognitive bias that the healthcare provider, not only doctors, so the healthcare provider is not only a doctor, it's the nurse, it's the person who drives the lorry into the hospital. I think you guys saw in COVID, everybody's, it's, it's a huge a network of things. So I think that is a positive element and you see a lot of work on the area. However, the cost to bring that into that domain is so large, okay? So if we're gonna replace a machine to do a task that I already training a human, don't get me wrong, you know, you might think, well, training the human is expensive, takes seven years, etc. Well, the cost of bringing those technologies to use at that large scale in those populations ain't gonna be any cheap at all. So it comes the problem again, what perhaps Maria was alluding is, who is going to actually own the technologies? Where are they going to be implemented? Who are they going to be benefiting that? And, and that brings a lot of the feedback of a very useful tool, which has perhaps uses and misuses and have a very negative social impact. Uh, whether it is possible to control it or not, I think that's a matter of, of our own personal view of the world. And, and, um, I think from the ethics point of view, I think there are frameworks we can work on that. I don't think it's easier to work on the market pressures on this, the markets uh, that influence industries and closed doors and, and, and on these things that will be less, less easier to control. Thanks. Over to you, we'll, yeah. Sorry? Over to you, Brooks. Okay, uh, I guess over, over to Kathy maybe, is that a... Hi, thanks. Um, and I'm going to try and pick up on, I think, what uh, John Maria and Andal Miro have said through three Ds, if I, if I can. The first is design. And I think that um, as an interaction designer, I, I care very much about how we how we envisage the future and, and how we explain that to people. So AI is, is a complex thing. It might seem simple to some of the people here, but for most people, it, it's very complicated. Um, and I think, as Maria um, said, that the, it shifts the center of power. Um, and that it can advance things very quickly. Um, and that means that we need to speculate about all of the possible problems that it could envisage, right? So um, we didn't know in the first industrial revolution we were burning holes in the ozone, <laughs> and we don't know uh, what problems we will be causing with the technology that we're creating today. And that doesn't mean it has to be all negative. It means that we need to, to really be honest and open and, and, and look to the future with all of the possibilities and the negatives um, and then sort of shift it to a more preferable uh, solution and I think one of the the problems in there brings me to my second D which is diversity which we picked up on before I think all of the problems that we see mostly in technology you know te technology is agnostic right but it, it picks up on our biases and and if it's created by a small percentage doesn't matter what small percentage of the world it is it will replicate those biases and so it's incumbent on us to to stop that to, to make sure that we are building diverse teams and, and not just diverse in terms of gender and not just diverse in terms of ethnical mix within one country, but diverse in terms of cultural understanding globally um, so that we understand the knock-on effects. So we can't speculate on the future of what's going to happen with AI and crop changes in say rural Uganda from London, 
that's insane. Right? So we need people from rural Uganda and, and policymakers from Uganda to be in that conversation and, and helping us to understand and, and us to, to, to understand the, the local um, ecosystem. And I suppose within diversity, obviously, I, I run the go part of the global disability innovation hub and I see huge opportunities for AI you know we have there's a, a handful in, in essence a few hundred sign language interpreters which are basically based in, if you take a country like Delhi I think there's about 380 qualified sign language interpreters for the entire country over a billion people so if you don't live in one of the major cities and you're deaf you you can't you know it's very difficult to communicate and most people then end up without education without jobs um, and so AI, it's a really, it's a, it's a low hanging fruit. And we're seeing projects all the time automatically creating now sign language uh, for people. And obviously that then brings the ability to translate across different languages and, and maybe hopefully open up levels of communication, uh, which brings me to my third D, which is um, discussion or, or discourse. Um, Maria mentioned how we have to be more open to answering the right questions. I think that, um, to start with, you have to sort of understand each other, right? And a lot of the times, computer scientists just seem a bit like an alien breed. <laughs> we don't we don't speak a, a language that maybe makes sense to to other people, and, and equally, their language might not make sense to us. So I think we need to have more open dialogue about what these problems are um, across the world. Um, and, and I'm delighted that John's Urkai Center, which I think is Urkai and not the not the letters, um, is, um, is is driving that that forward because. I think that is the that type of um, UNESCO label on things that allows that high level discussion, but also brings in the future generation is, is essential. And I'll just end by saying that I honestly believe it's the next generation, you know, the, the computer scientists uh, that are way that are a couple, generation behind me and maybe a couple of generations that will that will change this. And and I think they are, are far more socially conscious and, and socially aware, maybe because they're living in a world which is much more fragile. Um, I think we've seen the fragility of our ecosystem you know, laid bare over the last 18 months. And, and if you're younger and that's your, you know, it's a, it's a disproportionate amount of your life. Right. So it has a bigger impact. Um, and so I think when we start that discourse, we should be listening um, there as much as, as sharing what we know. I'll hand back over to you, Brooks. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you very much for the, the overview, actually. Um, and, and Julian, I guess uh, we'll let you go next. And then um, I, I think we're taking a lot of time, but I think everybody has been saying really excellent things. And also, I think it's, it's a, I, I think there's, I don't know, I, I have a huge amount of notes from this. And I think it's also remarkable how much we're, we're all sort of agreeing on a lot of these main points. Um, but I have a few notes on things we're not all agreeing on. So after Julian, maybe we can come back to this as well as take, uh, take questions. Thanks, Brooks. And well, thanks everyone for staying after a whole day of uh, Zooming. Um, I mean, to follow directly from Kathy, if I, if I were to start with a positive, I'm really excited to see the enthusiasm we are seeing in the huge wave of new machine learners, new AI researchers, new CS researchers who care so much for all these social and survival issues. I mean, so if you still look at NIRIT and the climate change for AI or AI for uh, social good or AI by the developing world uh, initiatives and workshops there that are completely packed. Um, when I was studying math, we had students whose main goal was to go into finance. I don't see that around anymore. I mean, we still have some who want to go to, to large tech and I went through that myself, uh, but there is much more consciousness about what's going on. And, and a, few, you know, a few years ago, I would have spend my whole time talking about great examples of how AI and ML can help. Uh, I've had the pleasure to work with Army City to take destroyed villages in Darfur uh, in, in conflict zones on satellite imagery, so empowering social actors at a bigger scale, uh, or analyzing the abuse online on Twitter, or crowdsourcing the detection of CCTV with you know, data science, not even fancy AI, um, with the key point there being not coming as a, you know, a tech savior, you know, stand back, we're gonna save the world with AI. That's now how it works. It was about empowering the people who actually have a clue about the social problems, uh, the UNESCO of this world, the amnesty. The, um, so, you know, there, there's, there was a lot down there and it was super exciting. The problem came to, okay, how do we keep funding that? 
we can have some really exciting hackathons. And, and, and it's great to see a lot of, of such hackathons that spend a weekend and help put a, a very nice proof of concept. Um, but how do we keep going on the long term? And that's where I started to become uh, uh, much more cautious because we see we started to see some industry funds going in around uh, you know the AI for social good fund for example from from Google uh, the AI for Earth from Microsoft but then you start digging and thinking well okay wow they're putting 65 million US dollars that's huge and then you do the math and you realize wait wait a minute that's two minutes of the company revenue from 2019. Ah, yeah, okay, let's look at the, maybe the profit instead of the revenue. Maybe they have cost. Yeah, it's 17 minutes of their net profit. And now the whole envelope of, uh, of AI for social good. Uh, and then you realize, wow, okay, there's a lot of ethics washing, which is, you know, exploiting very well meaning, but maybe somewhat naive scientists like I, I, I could have been. Um, and, and that's where I get the first thing for, for, for us and for all our students is there's an incredible leverage there. All the large companies into which power is being concentrated, thanks in part to AI and automation, are starving for talent. Uh, and as tech workers, there is a lot of leverage we can have here, voting where we go with our feet, but also being within our employers, very conscious and educating ourselves about, okay, what can these be used to? Uh, Cory Doctorow, uh, who's a fantastic thinker and writer of science fiction, who uses science fiction to carry uh, people through an emotional journey on really pressing issues, including the use of tech. Um, if, you, if you haven't read it, I really encourage uh, reading some of his uh, Little Brother trilogy or his uh, Attack Surface most recent book. Um, as, as this way of thinking about, okay, there's a new technology, I think of what it does, and, and that's what we're all doing. You know, what does it do? How can I get you know, my algorithm to do this better? For whom and to whom? Uh, which goes similar to what Delmiro was saying. And when you start looking at that, you really quickly realize, oh, okay, that that is not necessarily pretty. Um, and, and that's where, okay, it might get somewhat uncomfortable as a worker, okay, I'm doing that and I have no control actually, you know, I'm working for a big company, I have no control who's benefiting and um, where it is going. I have no control, say if I work at Google, I have no control that Jeff Dean is firing Timit Gebru, who's one of the biggest voice of diversity and one of them winning many more. Uh, well, where we do have control is when we start, yes, putting with our feet, choosing where we work, but also starting to get a critical mass of voices, and that's where you see uh, unions like the Tech Worker Alliance, for example, where employees organize, not necessarily to get you know better perks or better, more holidays, no, to get a really strong voice when looking at the applications of their work by their company. We are at the forefront of the development. We are those in the lab, you know, doing the math science. We'll be the first ones to be able to see, voila, that, that, that can be not pretty. Uh, and we need to build the structures where we can actually, you know, I want to say rise and, and unite, but, you know, actually raise the alarm and then hopefully put enough pressure that this doesn't go in these uh, in these terrible directions. Now, in conclusion, there's, you know, a few years ago, it was all about, okay, what we can do uh, as, as actors, you know, empowering the, the actors on social good, but now it's equally about what we can avoid uh, being done. Uh, and I, I was really stricken how, you know, all the panelists in the preparation were very much, we we're all, all aligning around these ideas. Okay, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure. Okay, so I, I'm not seeing the questions right now, but that's okay, because I have plenty of things that I, I could also ask you guys. Um, for example, well, there's a few things. So. Um, so what's the role of uh, different types of institutions in this? For example, where do you think universities fit in uh, in terms of lar large companies? And, and to that extent also, what can we do as, as individuals? So I guess, you know, 
Julian, you're suggesting unionizing, but also like, I mean, how can we actively uh, aim as, as individuals to work towards, towards helping these things? Um, and I guess I'm thinking about this because uh, from some of what you, you guys are all saying, uh, some of these applications things uh, that will happen one way or the other, right? It sounds like there's a lot of incentives to uh, have the AI systems for agriculture um, exist, and then those will probably be maintained just out of, of profit motive. Uh, whereas it sounds in other places, maybe maybe this won't happen because say the, the startup costs of say, uh, incorporating these AI systems that would help with cognitive load into healthcare systems might be so insurmountable that it takes a long time for anyone to ever make this kind of transition just because there, there might not be ever a moment of so much intense pressure. And I guess related to that, I mean, so Julian, you're talking about the, these ethics washing, but on the other hand, uh, 17 minutes of Google net profit or, or 19 minutes, whichever, I mean, that's still, a, that's not an insubstantial amount of money, right? So this is still something where if we could encourage companies to direct this kind of money uh, productively, then maybe this could help in one of these sort of settings. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the sort of other context of this, which I think everybody mentioned is, uh, um, uh, any of these situations will lead to some kind of centralization of power, no matter how this happens, we should be cautious of this and, and, and watch out for this and will exacerbate inequalities potentially. But I, I, I guess, um, does anyone have some sort of thoughts on where, where you see sort of our, our actions as individuals or actions that like uh, an institute such as UCL or the AI Center could take in order to materially kind of contribute to, to this development? I can make one small comment and that maybe others will jump in. Um, I mean, I do think that uh, we're in a very interesting situation in which, you know, really the power seems to be in a very small number of hands. And, but equally, the technology is actually accessible very widely because the, public, the work is published. And many of these tech companies are actually making some of the core software available. So I don't, I mean, you know, I think that's actually a very positive part of their role. You know, the TensorFlow is, is there for everyone to use. And we've certainly used that to encourage projects, say, in Africa, where, you know, some particular data sets can be developed and analyzed. So that to some extent there is, and I, you know, I wouldn't want to paint it all negatively in terms of the, the, the concentration of power. But I think, you know, what, what uh, academia can do and individual researchers can promote the development of tools that will make that transfer of technology, transfer of power, let's call it, as uh, easy and as uh, you know as successful as possible. And and I am very keen on the idea that we shouldn't think of you know oh yes we need to have super you know AI experts who know the very details of the training algorithms in every in order to make use of the technology we need to think about you know pitching the technology to people at a much less technical level and that certainly you know tensorflow is is relatively easy to use I and mean, obviously you do need to have some computer science background but maybe it can be translated and you know i know there was some work being done at ucl around the natural language processing area and so on that would actually make this technology much more accessible to just you know, maybe entrepreneurs who, who haven't got a computer science background but can see an opportunity. And that's the way we generate the new jobs that I think Del Nero you know, was referring to, generate the new solutions and, you know, create the diversity of uh, applications and uh, see that transfer to solving problems in the field in different parts of the world. So in that sense, I think that would be the way I would say we can help and you know, research in that direction would be hugely valuable. John, do you think following from that, just throwing this on the on the, on the carpet, uh, will it be interesting to have a regulatory agency as we have other regulatory agencies uh, for other things like, for example, medicines, food and drug administration, so they even, even financial system have regulatory agencies. Do you think do you think is that the creation of such a regulatory because of the implications are, are very large so will it be um will it be kind of a, something as an as a, something which to think of 
something in, on yeah sorry Mary, yeah. So i was just going to say that something in in that area has already started last year with a kind of standard for documenting data sets which i think is very much needed because we don't have standards laws and documentation and the paper which i'm going to send is very interesting because it also talks about when there was no standards for hardware and the kind of problems that would arise from that and how we are seeing similar problems now in software and how probably having standards for algorithms and data sets could up to some extent solve those by giving you know ideas of recommended uses problems that can arise and so on so it's something that has started but just last year but it's not as a regulatory agency it's a recommended recommendatory process which yes. is different in a sense because the regulatory agency will have to have some some let's say legal framework in order to have a executable, executable arm to it or maybe that's a role of the united nations so john or the unesco sorry sorry actually ai you know there is ai regulation being uh, put forward by the european union uh, which okay. would have that kind of but i noticed kathy got her hand up come on kathy uh, thanks, John. I um, I just wanted to say that I think that academics, maybe we can do, a, or some of us at least, a, a subset can do a, a little bit more work in trying to help uh, policymakers and, and people like it, organizations like the, the UN really understand the technology. Um, I, I think that we have to realize that we're living in a very strange geopolitical time. It, it's, it's, it's in flux. And there seems to be a, a move away from trusting things like the UN, um, you know, and, and not not backing um, global cooperation. And I and I think this is quite a worrying thing because if we end up with the power being in in multinational companies uh, without a, a collaboration uh, which is not profit driven, then we could end up in in quite a tricky uh, quite a tricky position. And and I'm sure that. It, nobody in leading any of the CEOs of the, the major companies, uh, multinational companies in this area, won't be driving, you know, to, to do anything unethical. They'll be wanting, you know, that they're, they're good humans too, they want to do good things, but, un, but power that's unregulated in some way can, can be corrupt no matter how good you are as a human being, right? So, so I feel like we have to be quite, um, quite cognizant of the fact that we are creating new things and we are creating new humans like the next generation that we teach so even if you don't become an academic you, you learn stuff and then you might go off and work uh, in these companies and obviously you vote and you, you do other things but i think that we need to make sure that we are influencing at the right levels so if we only create people that go and work for large companies that have a social conscience great but if the regulatory um, framework, and not, when I say regulatory framework, I don't necessarily mean what you mean, Del Miro, like let's set up a regulatory body. I, I mean more like a, a space where we collaborate, <laughs> like the European Union has done on, on their regulations on AI, a space where we collaborate, we understand, like Maria said, data sets, from how they could be used and shared, um, and that we understand the biases that, that might be there and, and, and how we might be able to, to overcome them. So. I, I don't think that's easy, and I'm not sure how to do it, if, if I'm really honest. It's not like I know how to do that, but I, I do think that we can, you know, the people above us in universities can value those contributions as much as a ref paper or, a, you know, a, a, a kind of a high, you know, win a 20 million pound grant or influence this bit of policy should be the same weight, right? Like, you know, it has just as much impact. So I think that we can influence the people above us to set better metrics for, for us to be able to develop into better uh, socially good academics, if that makes sense, um, and then hope that the next generation are all equally able to um, find ways and mechanisms of, of making um, the, the technology more socially good. Yeah, the only problem I have with that is that lobbying and policy makers sometimes, you know, we, we have a responsibility, and I think COVID have put things in perspective. No matter than I am, you, whatever, us, we are less person A, Y, and C. When we do that, in a way, we are we are doing a loving, and 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 that's what I'm saying. Well, I know I know it's not an easy solution for this, but uh, since you put a regulatory framework and meaning of so a way of doing that loving, perhaps, or at least a way how to do the influence of the policymakers and the others, what perhaps we need is like an intermediate solution. 
because if we leave it, if we leave it as to us as a human behavior, it's going to be disorder, dis disorder, disorganized. Okay. If we leave it to, as you say, the regulatory is going to be too broken, and you know it will be too hidden as well. Um, and it's kind of an intermediate position, perhaps, what is needed. Like, how do you pass recommendations uh, under which to these policymakers, or, or they, or, or how do they, how do you do the lobbying of of avoiding getting into into let's say unethical or or things which have social repercussions, you know. I think Julian might want to speak, but I'm happy to come back on on that afterwards. I, I, don't, see people, I don't see ahead. people hands at all. West, okay, I don't see everybody here. West, okay. Go ahead, Kathy, please. Well, I was just going to say I don't think it's lobbying. Uh, lobbying is a different thing, right? Lobbying is influencing, and, 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 and I'm talking about a space for collaboration where agreements are made. Um, so I'm talking about how you, uh, and maybe they, maybe those agreements become regulations. Sometimes they might become guidelines. I'm just saying that beyond regulations, there's something beyond regulations. Like regulations is one part of the puzzle, um, uh, but we also need a wider conversation, um, which can be led, I think, by institutions that already exist. So. John's new center, it, you know, the UNESCO center or the Urkai center under the auspices of UNESCO, um, that, that I think it holds a great space because it allows um, academic rigor to be presented in, in, a, in a conversational way with external people to AI, present emergent thinking, whether it be on ethics or, you know, other social aspects of AI, and then those documents or, or pieces, <laughs> there's, there's artifacts that get produced out of, out of the centre, can, can then be used to influence, because they will influence, right? when, we present, when we produce anything it influences, right? So I don't think it's lobbying per se, but, and I would agree with you that we should not be lobbyists, um, that we would have different jobs then, um, but I just think that building on your idea of regulation, I think that there's something within, sort of be around and beyond regulation that, that is necessary. If you know what I mean. Did you, Julian, did did you, you wanna... have thoughts on this? Is that a... Yeah, so much around the, the lobbying power. If you look at the, the budget for, 2018, for 2019, uh, the lobbying budget by uh, the, the biggest companies, I think Apple was a, the smallest at 7 million, Google at $11 million. That's just for, for lobbying in the US. Facebook at 16, Amazon at 16 millions too. So if we go into, in, into lobbying indeed, um, well, it's gonna be really hard to compete. Even if 65 million of the 17 minutes of Google is, is a lot of money, it's gonna be really hard to, to, to align oneself with that. We do have, especially as, as universities, um, a visibility though uh, and uh, sort of reference uh, or historical reference point of view that can bring some form of authority in the conversation. And when we are seeing, you know, as Maria mentioned, we are seeing survival questions, really. Um, I think we, we, we do have a duty to use that voice extremely loudly. But more than that, to help our, you know, our students and the people go through to our formations and our training to learn how to express their voices too uh, and, and, be, and be loud. I mean, it, it is quite telling that it took a high schooler to start some of the biggest climate protests uh, we, we have in the world. It took a high schooler without, hey, you know what? I don't have much to lose there. I don't have a career to, to, to think of. Um, I find that extremely powerful. And she speaks much more clearly when she goes to the UN and gets, yes, angry. And angry is not very diplomatic. And I know that's for sure something that we don't do quite do a lot of here in the UK. I'm French with a terribly bad temper. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I think if we get more people more angry, we might see more, more motion. If at near Apes, we could be, you know, more excited about, hey, how is our technology going to be used? Um, rather than saying, hey, I got the best benchmark on, on MS Coco, I would sleep much better at night. Uh, and, and 
you know, that's where I think as academics, we can take these positions and we have the freedom to take this position. Uh, let's be clear. I was helping organize a, a, a round table by Amnesty and UNICEF uh, for the World Economic Forum on AI and human rights back in 2017. And I reached out to some of my mates in some of the large companies very, very close to here. Um, companies that I think, you know, really highly often in the scientific terms. But hey, do you want to come? I'm going to be the only scientist guy at this table. We need, you know, more scientists to say more clearly what is feasible right now versus what isn't. And, and they were, yeah, you're super interesting. Let me ask permission. And the permission was, you know, denied saying, yeah, no, don't worry, you're pretty little scientific mind about it. We're going to send someone from our ethics and society team. And that company sent someone very competent from their ethics and society team with a degree in international law, um, but was hoarding its scientific talent behind the world and also in so doing, preventing that scientific talent from being sensitized and sensitized to the, the, the issues at, at stake. Um, so if we get our you know, whole community to you know, want to abolish this world and be part of these conversations to, and, and these discussions, uh, as Kathy mentioned, I think we'll have done a really good job there. So uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you, Julian, because I think that was actually an excellent point to end this on to wrap it up. So um, I don't know, I guess I would like to thank all of you uh, again for for um, for being part of this panel and um, everybody for attending and also for the entire day. Uh, this is uh, this is great. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for thank organizing. You. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So that concludes the events for the day today. Thank you so much to all the panelists and all the presenters. It's been a fascinating day, um, really insightful. We will be uh, editing the day into videos which will be shared on our YouTube channel. Um, and you can also engage with us, obviously, on Twitter as well. Um, we can share information on the papers. Uh, I've been sharing that on Twitter if you want to go and check that out at the Artificial Intelligence Centre on Twitter. Um, and we do have other events coming up in the future, which we'll be discussing entrepreneurship, which is mentioned today, um, and um, things like bias and ethics and responsibilities. So please do check out our Twitter feed and our website to find out more about what's going on at the AI Centre. Thank you again um, for joining us.